morning, Ipsy Pri. I'm Becca, and I want to welcome you this morning. We hope that your experience is great and that you're experiencing the love of God in our gathering. If you're curious about Ipsy Pri community, stop by our welcome wall right here. It's in the lobby. Another great way for you to do that is by filling out our Connect card. You can find them in the pew in front of you or online at ipsyfree.org slash connect. Would you pull that out right now? Throughout our service this morning, we'd love for you to consider your next steps. What is Jesus inviting you to do? Maybe you want to learn more about small groups or you're ready to be baptized. Whatever your next steps, let us know on the back of the connect card and drop them off in the giving boxes in the lobby. Mark your calendars for Friday, January 28th. We're gathering at 7 p.m. for a night of prayer and worship. This evening will be powerful in conclusion to our 21 days of prayer and fasting as we encounter the depths of God's love. We are eagerly anticipating a new session of small groups here at Ipsy Free. If you have a plan to facilitate a group or even if you just have some ideas, please let us know on the Connect card. Thanks for gathering with us today. Let's stand together now as we worship in song. Well, good morning, Ipsy Free. Good morning, Ipsy Free in person and online. Hello, hello. We're going to worship God this morning, and we're going to start with the song, Your Love Awakens. And I was just reflecting on the, the, the God who calls Lazarus out of the grave and says, wake up, or to the little girl who, who was known to be dead, and he said, wake up wake up. So this morning, that same God is calling you to wake up, to get the shakes going and to move your fingers and your toes and to move a little bit during this song. So let's celebrate the God and his love that awakens us this morning. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, 
Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. us from the dead, who raises us from our sins, who unchains us from the things that can keep us bound, right? The things that can keep us stuck in sin. That same, that God is a God of justice, that God is a God of mercy, and that is, God is a God who wants us to walk humbly. Let's read this scripture together from Psalm 68. I'm going to read part, you're going to read part and we're going to go back and forth a little bit, okay? All right, Psalm 68. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. Together we say, but, but may, may the, the righteous, righteous be glad and, and rejoice before God. May, may they, they be happy and, and joyful. joyful. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. As a father to the fatherless, amen. amen. A defender of the widows, when we say together, is, is God, God in, in his, his holy dwelling. dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He, he leads, leads out the prisoners, prisoners with singing. singing. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, we say, the, the earth, earth shook, the, the heavens poured down, down rain. rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel, you gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. We say together, your people settled in it, and, and from, from your bounty, bounty God, you provided for the poor. the poor. Amen. Amen. This is the God who took his people out of slavery, who brought them through the wilderness of challenge and, and all sorts of elements and protected them and brought them into the land that was promised. God protects the lowly. He lifts up the marginalized. He defeats those who are wicked. And, and oh Lord, may we be the righteous. May we follow in your footsteps as we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Let's sing about it. It all comes down to this What you require of me Love my neighbor as myself And you above all things Act justly, love mercy Walk humbly with you, God down to this to be your hands and feet good news to all the world that's our job the, the truth, truth will set us free act justly love mercy walk humbly with you God in all things Always walk humbly with you, God. It's beauty for ashes, it's morning to dancing, it's closer and closer the kingdom of heaven. It's beauty for ashes, it's morning to dancing, it's closer and closer the kingdom of heaven. Years from now we'll see the fruit our hands 
have sown faith just like a seed the only way it grows act justly love mercy walk humbly God, in all things, in all ways, walk humbly with you, God. Amen. Friends, may we live that out. May that be our testimony. Amen. Amen. Good morning, God. 
stay in this song for just a minute. We're worshiping, worshiping the God who is good. So sing or say out loud or in your heart whatever melodies or words come to your mouth about how God is so good. chest are we before you now Lord soaking in your love soaking in your goodness oh you're so good you're so
as we continue in this season of worship. Let's pray. Father, your people have just sung how good you are. And truly you are good. Father, each one of us have a story here to tell of your goodness. Perhaps it was just getting up this morning. For others, it, it may be, I have a job. <laughs> as, as easy as that might be able to be said, it's a blessing to have jobs. Lord, it's others who are grateful for family, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, children. Lord, you are so good. And Father, we praise you this morning. We ask for a visitation of your spirit upon us as a congregation this morning. Father, move among us for, for those who are indifferent right now, for, for those who, uh, well, came here uh, with uh, a lot on their minds. Lord, we pray that your spirit would move across this place because you are the only one that can regulate minds, change situations, comfort those who need comforting, heal those who need healing. And, and Father, we, <laughs> speaking of healing, Father, we, we pray that uh, 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 an additional touch of your healing uh, power to, to rest upon our congregation this morning for those who are in need of that touch. Father, we thank you. Uh, we, we thank you and praise you that you're the God uh, that's not only good, but you're the God of mercy. You're, you're the God of justice. You're the, the God of righteousness, of grace. Uh, well, really, the, the list is endless. Because you do all things well. Father, so, so teach your people today and always to trust you. You tell us to bring our cares and concerns to you, for you care for us. Father, and, and as you do, Lord, we'll be careful to give your name the praise. Father, we thank you that you remind us that seeds produce plants. You reap just what you sow. Father, you tell us in your precious word to love others. And in return, you'll receive love. Father, we, we have a lot to, to thank you for this morning. And, uh, Father, we just ask, and we can't ask enough for, for you just, again, to, to, to cause revival. That's, that's the word we're looking for, Lord. Cause revival to sweep across our congregation, touching men and women, boys and girls. And Father, if and when you do, we'll be careful to give your name the praise. We commit this time to you now, Lord. It's not our time. It's your time, and we want you to have your own way among us. We love you, Lord, and thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Did you know God played a game of truth or dare with his people? In fact, he's still at it. In Malachi 3.10, God declares, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. It's like God is saying, come on, just give it a try, I dare you. 
This practice of giving is one of our defining characteristics as Ipsy Free people. We invite you to join us this morning by giving in person using the giving boxes. Giving securely online at ipsyfree.org slash give or by sending your donation in the mail. Thank you for giving. Let's grab our Bibles now and return to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Please stand for the reading of God's word. From Matthew 7, verse 12. So, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. May the Lord honor the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, hello. It's good to see you and... To be seen by those online today, thanks Chase for reading for us, appreciate that. We are in Matthew, and we are coming to the close of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this manifesto of Jesus uh, regarding his kingdom, uh, and I would like you to do this. Even though we have heard it read, I would like for us to read it together now. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. How many of you were taught the golden rule in school? I know it was mentioned quite often. I'm not sure we got it. Uh, once the bell rang for recess, all bets were off on the golden rule, I think. In fact, uh, I was re recollecting that in the wintertime, there used to, used to be snow, and it would be piled up in our, in our yard, in our recess yard, and we would play King of the Mountain. Now, anybody ever played King of the Mountain? How many enjoy playing King of the Mountain? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was that game that I think, you know, the golden rule just bit the dust. It really did, but I loved playing king of the mountain. I don't think I would like it today, but J.R. Stott tells of the story from the Old Testament Apocrypha of two famous rabbis um, who were approached by a young inquirer, in, you know, of Judaism. He, he was interested. Uh, the first rabbi, his name is Sh Shammai, and uh, he went to him and he said, uh, Rabbi Shammai, as I stand on one foot, summarize the Torah and the prophets. Well, Rabbi Shammai uh, was not, um, he was a little curmudgeon and was perturbed by this insolence of this young inquirer. And as the story goes, just kind of shoot him off. Get, get out of here. And so this young inquirer, there were two rabbis that were kind of key at the time. Hello. He went over to him and said, Rabbi Hello, would you sum up the, uh, the, law, the Torah and the prophets for me as I stand on one leg? And Rabbi Hillel said to him this, What is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. All the rest is all commentary. Now, I don't know if you get that, but we'll keep diving in. It was very much the case and the course during Jesus' time for rabbis to attempt to sum up the law. So let's get into the text today and take it really almost word for word because it's powerful. So this is referencing everything that had, Jesus had mentioned prior to this. And as we studied last night that God's love for you as a son and daughter is immense, right? He said to us in verse 11, 
Jesus says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He's saying, look, your Father in heaven is good. He's right. And when you ask of him, he will give you good gifts. It could also be, and we'll get into this a little bit later, that this is a summary of the whole of the Sermon on the Mount right here. In its essence, he goes on, in everything, which means the same thing in Greek as it does in English, means everything. That's right, in all things, whatever you do, in all your work and your rest, your play, in everything you do, he goes on, do to others. We, we take notice here in the Greek that he does not use the word anthropoi, uh, which he does use the word, excuse me, he does use the word anthropoi, which means not brother and sister, but actually all people, anybody, as in love, all people. I think you might have heard that before a time or two. He doesn't use the word, which would have been more common and more uh, to, the, to the people around him. Uh, he doesn't use the word delphois, which means brother or sister. I mean, it has that connotation of those inside the family network. But it's anybody due to others, those with uh, different beliefs and religion due to others, those with different skin color due to others. He is talking those who are like and are unlike you that you are to do to others. He says, so in everything and to all people, do to others as you would have them do to you. So there are several different ways I suppose we could translate this passage from the Greek. Whatever you wish others would do for you, do to them. Um, Treat others as you want to be treated. Here's a simple rule. Also yourself. What you want others to do for you, go and do for them. Take the initiative and just go out and do it. Jesus is giving us a general rule here how to relate to others, no matter who you are. Take the moment and think about them and how you would want to be treated if you were them in their skin, in their place, in their time, and go and do it. And he finishes with this, for this sums up the law and the prophets. This is, in essence, all that is taught in the Bible. This is everything right here. I mean, all the law and prophets for them at the time would be the first five books of the Old Testament, and the rest were the prophets. Anybody who spoke about God would have been considered prophets. And he says, this sums up all of it. This sums up all of it. In this, he is telling us a summary of the Sermon on the Mount. We often leave the Old Testament and get into the New Testament. But if we were to really understand Jesus and understand Jesus well, we have to be students, connoisseurs, dwellers in the Old Testament because that's where Jesus was. In fact, you can look at the Sermon on the Mount and what is he teaching on? He's only teaching on the Old Testament. He's going back, this is what has been taught to you, but I teach you this. I mean, he over and over dives back into the Old Testament and says, this is important. And Jesus, at his very heart, is a Bible teacher, desiring for those around him to understand the full script, the full scripture, and bringing his interpretation. He had a deep, deep love for scripture. He came to bring it to life and and to, to school all those around him and who would come after, with, who had ears to hear, who would listen to what he had to say. And it was based around Old T- Testament scriptures. It's so important for us to understand this. A few months ago, we talked about dwelling in scripture. And we only get that because that's where Jesus dwelt. It's not only that scripture commands it, but that's where he lived his essence out of. This one line statement, though. Here in the midst of the sermon is a, is, is a summary. But it also gives us a window into the very nature that the sermon was about relationships. Relationships not only 
with God, but relationships with one another. Do to others as you would have them do to you. There's no separation in your relationship with God from your relationship with one another. Absolutely not. Whether with your mom or your dad, your husband or wife, your niece or nephew, your neighbor, the people you meet on the street, all people. But Jesus is not only summarizing the 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 Sermon on the Mount, but he's summarizing, as was asked of Hillel and Shammai, the whole of the Bible. In fact, we get a little deeper in Matthew, but it's also found in Mark, which will be on your screen here. That Jesus has asked, what is the greatest commandment? In all of the Bible, and he answers this question, and we have to really grasp this. This is an answer that's found in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. While most scholars would agree that the Jesus Creed, which is what Scott McKnight calls what we just read, has, is coined as the greatest commandment, it is. It is found right here in Matthew chapter 7, this one-line statement that summarizes it in a teachable type of way, probably in a tweetable type of way, too. Do to others as you would have them do to you. One application is used for one purpose, and the other is for teaching. As I referred to, though, this statement, this one-line statement, this summary of not only the Sermon on the Mount, but the whole of the Bible is called what we call the golden rule. Do you know how it earned its name being called the golden rule? Besides being a primetime statement of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? A Roman emperor named Alexander Servius saw, read, and adopts the golden rule as his motto across his empire. And he said, you know, wouldn't this be a great thing if all rulers, all people who led adopted this? He took it one step further, though. Not only did he adopt it as his motto and made it all over, but he displayed it on public buildings, and guess what the the tale says? In gold. That's where it gets traced back to this idea that it's it's the golden rule or it's the golden standard. Just maybe, just maybe we need to have this written on every wall of our house, Right? We walk in and we go, oh, in our buildings, whoa, right? Ethics just says they, there are three rules that most people live by, and we'll take each one as they come. The first one is called the wooden rule, and maybe you've never heard this before, but you've seen it lived out. Do to others what they would do to you. Um, as we might say uh, in one kind of statement it's a tip for a tat you shove me i'll shove you you gossip about me i'll gossip about me you're mean to me i'm passive aggressive back right it's this interplay if you treat me in a certain way i'm going to treat you back and you're thinking oh yeah i've seen this before sure you have you have uh if you have kids in your house you've seen this before uh We'll get into it. Maybe even you have implemented this before. Well, we can always and most often see it in the negative. It can also be seen in the positive. You compliment me, I'll compliment you. You have, you know, you take me out for a meal, I'll take you out for a meal. It's just kind of this back and forth. It's living within these zones that, uh, you know, are good. But we have these words that are found in the Sermon on the Mount that penetrate this base way of living. Love your enemies. It just comes penetrating through this. Yet what we have come to understand, this is a vicious cycle of the life we may view and may even find ourselves in on occasion. Yet what we have found, humanity has not risen above this way of doing life too often. Many people continue to live in in these toxic ways of living and thrive in reactivity and revenge. If this is tough for you to grasp and believe, if you're on social media at all, you don't have to go far, right? Or even on TV, or even the headlines if you have a newspaper, (laughs) in your newspaper. 
The essences say there's another rule. It's a silver rule, which may be more understandable because it's closely aligned to Hillel's response. Do not do to others as you do not want them to do to you. And this is a far leap above this idea of living in the wooden rule, this, this tit for tat. This is leaps and bounds above. And we kind of look at it and go, oh, that's just the negative statement of Jesus' positive statement. It's this gigantic leap. We know this rule predates Jesus, as in reference to Hillel's response to the inquiry. But even it's found with other religions and other ideas. There's a book uh, called Ethics and the Golden Rule. Somebody has chronicled the historical Uh, historical move toward the golden rule and through it. His name's Henry Gensler, and he chronicles this. I picked out a few of them from the book. In the East, about 500 B.C., Confucius says this, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Uh, Zoroaster and Persia, about 500 B.C., that character is best that doesn't do to another what isn't good for itself. Aristotle, we know that name if we've taken philosophy class. We should conduct ourselves towards others as we would have them act toward us. While the silver rule is a leap ahead of do to others do to others what they would have to do to you, and as a good practice to live in, we can see it and recognize that it's It's living below Jesus' desired statement, his desired place to live. There's quite a big difference. To cause, to not cause suffering is vastly different than to do something to alleviate suffering of another. Do no harm is a good idea, but it's not the same as love your enemy. Many of us have adopted practices in our daily lives shopping-wise, if you will, that lift the oppression of the poor around us. Yet we have to admit, do justice for the poor is a whole other thing. I mean, you can shop for the right kind of chocolate, and that's great, but there's a whole other thing to lift the oppression of the poor around you, to see them and to step into their shoes and to love them as they need to be loved. See, we can see that the silver rule is good, but it does not take us to living out love as Jesus would want us to. We need to move into the realm of the golden rule. Golden rule is this. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Jesus speaking these words from his lips, from what I have found out and from what others have, what I've read about is the first time this ever hit our atmosphere. I mean, can you imagine these words coming off his lips? And it began to reverberate on the eardrops of humanity ever since. What a word to drop. And it's still the word that reverberates to this day, that echoes within us as a hope, doesn't it? We live in a day when people talk of love in our culture, yet when they talk of love, they're talking about tolerance. They're talking of potentially niceness. What's good for you is good for you. You do you. This whole idea of love that is contained without truth. Yet, as I indicated, it's not true. Last couple of years, this idea of love, as the culture defines it, intolerance and niceness just doesn't work anymore, right? Uh, Let's have an open conversation of who you voted for. Exactly. Right? About the time we do... There's a whole bunch of hypocrisy that takes place in that conversation piece because people can't allow us to own what we don't. The tolerance is out the door. And part of it is because love is more about a feeling than it truly is about an action. Jesus demonstrated to us an action of love. He is our Messiah, and it's less about feeling than about doing the right thing, how you act, how you behave. All day long, we can control what we do and do not do. We can, what we can say and not say. If we define love as a feeling, it's quite shallow definition though, isn't it? I feel good. I feel this is the right place to be. I want the experience of love, not the engagement of doing the right thing, which is an action. 
Jesus' definition of love, setting, love is, is setting the well-being of someone else before our own, even if it comes to us as a great cost. That is his definition of love. Where do we get that? Well, just a couple of verses that you know well, but as a great reminder, Philippians 2 says to us, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Wow. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He shed himself, if you will, took on our form. Paul writes this, in another, uh, Paul, uh, and this is written in 1 John 3.16, not by Paul, but by John. Th- and this is how we know what love is. This is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is love. And we know. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is what love looks like lived out. This is what do to others as they would do to you looks like. Jesus died for the whole world, for everyone. He went to the margins of culture and community in his day and in our day to rescue the throngs who were trampled by injustice, those who are being treated and misaligned. I I can think of one person as we move to a date to remember who lived this out in a grand way. Dr. Martin Luther King, too, believed in the golden rule. In fact, I would say that it flowed through him. It flowed through him. His deep desire and his core conviction to create change in our country flowed from this idea of loving others to do to others as you would want them to have to do to you has led to the right to right the injustice against men and women segregated because of the skin of their color of their skin last march kathy and i had the opportunity to accompany two of our kids as they were looking for housing in the dc area when you get in the area you want to walk the mall it's just a wonderful place to be As part of the trip, we were able to go to the mall and see the monument of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's just a a wonderful, powerful um, statue and monument. As many of you know, because you've probably been there already, there are sayings around the outside of the statue of Dr. Martin Luther King. This is just one of them. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Where do you think he got it? From his, from his Messiah and Lord Jesus. I love this other one. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. I'm currently reading His Truth is Marching On by John Meacham about the life of John Lewis. This idea of The golden rule being lived out was lived out in in dramatic ways that I have to take great pause when I read certain passages of that book. As as it's told about John Lewis, Dr. Martin Luther King's in there, but how they stood and did not react to the violent outbursts on them. How does one do this? How does one look at another desiring to see change and know that they're going to get beat. He stood in the midst of the injustice and then did not retaliate. It it, it takes more than a resolve of the heart, I believe. I think it takes a transformation of the heart to be able to do that. The realization that someone else has already done it for you and you can do it for others. That's this 11, verse 11 and verse 12 playing off each other. Hey, your father's a good father. Guess what? Do to others as you would have them do to you. So let me ask you. What would it be like to live the golden rule in your marriage? You've... 
you've been having these conversations with your spouse, and they be and they they started out innocently, and maybe about the the smallest thing, and all of a sudden that you see and sense that they're accelerating to a crescendo. And in previous situations, you would pull out some of the emotional responses of where your limbic system takes over your heart and your mind, and you begin to then speak things and say things you shouldn't do. But what would, what would be the difference in those situations when you're disagreeing where finances should be spent or how they have been spent? Wouldn't it be better just to, just to breathe in a little bit? To remind ourselves, what, what is it about my spouse? Why is it? What's transpiring? To be able to gain a vantage point from their place in the situation. What about with your kids? It's the tenth time you've had to tell them, and you're exasperated. you realize that they're only 11 years old. You take a deep breath and you go, what do you to others as I would want to have done to me? What do you do? What about your workplace in which you think your your, your, uh, co-workers may be morons or imbeciles? And you've thought this in your head and you've almost said it out loud. Or maybe you have said it out loud in a meeting. But what would it be if you walked in realizing, oh, God is so good. He has taken care of my needs. He wishes for me to treat others as he has treated me with grace and mercy and love to transform the very situation, transform my heart and the very situation I'm in. And you, instead of going in with a head full of your ideas and thoughts, you take a deep breath and step in and go, hey, can you explain this a little bit more to me? I'd like to grasp where you're coming from. What would it look like as a community of people who we slowed down our responses to be able to take in the other on the other side of the conversation You see, really, the question that I wonder would happen is, what what if we lived the golden rule and ran it in the background of our minds? What if it ran in the background of our minds? J.R. Stark puts it this way, if we put ourselves sensitively in the place of the other person and wish for him or her what we wish for ourselves, we would never be mean always generous, never harsh, always understanding, never cruel, always kind. Now, if we think for a moment that do to others as you would have them do to you leaves truth out, it doesn't leave truth out. In Jesus' kingdom, we always bring truth with us, but we bring it in a way that, that sees the other person and begins to attempt to match them. So what if this happened? What if... What if the golden rule lived, what if we lived the golden rule and it ran in the background of our minds? And you may say, Steve, I, I live it out. So when you got cut off the last time on the highway, what'd you do with your hands? Or your mind? Or did you speed up? You see what I'm saying? It's sometimes those reactions are so quick. Our limbic symptom plays havoc on us, and we do have greater control. So maybe you, like me, and our next steps is just simply this. It's to repent. To realize as you chronicle over the, you think back over this last week, and you realize, oh, Jesus. I wasn't treating the other person as I wanted to be treated. In fact, I gave them the what for, and I was proud of it. I yelled at them, screamed at them. those groups of people that you drive past, you don't even want to spend time with them. And you don't even know them. 
but you generalize a statement about them. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I need help in those situations. I need help. Help that's beyond me. Help that is greater than just, uh, you know, oh, yeah, that's right, I'm supposed to be loving and kind. But I need help from the Spirit. I think first step outside of repentance, and maybe that's where we often find ourselves today, is pray. Is pray. So what would it look like before you go into the next meeting or next work day or have a conversation with your wife or, you, or, or the conversation of, uh, with whoever it may be and you're having difficult living out this idea due to others as they would do to you? What could you pray? What could you pray? Well, you can pray generally, but I want to leave you with one that some of us are very familiar with, with and some of us may not be as familiar with. It's found in Lectio 365. It ends at the every day. And it's this prayer, Lord, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Now, that may not be your prayer, but that's a great place to start. Being true to you. Giving myself away. I think aligned with praying is this idea of reflecting and maybe even role playing in our heads. Setting ourselves, slowing down our responses in some cases so that we can, we can kind of, whoa, wait a second, what's happening here? Quick to respond. But as scripture says, we're supposed to be slow to speak, slow to get angry. And then once we have prayed, once we have reflected on where we're at, just as the song says, we act justly. We act as Jesus would act. Live out love. Can I add one more that I think is vital to our ability individually to act as Jesus would want us to act. And that is to be in community with one another. To have this place in which you are able to vulnerably say, I screwed up. I thought the wrong thought. I said the wrong thing. And they say, now they look at you and they give you grace and they give you mercy and they then tell you, you are forgiven Go and sin no more. This last week, I had a group of friends that I meet with, and they are that for me. And this last week, I had to cough up something that I was thinking and how it could contaminate my heart not to do the right thing, not to live out love. And in that moment, in fact, some of you are scared to even do this, but in that moment for me, they looked at me and said, Steve, you didn't have to say a word. We wouldn't have never known. It didn't matter to us because we wouldn't have known. But you made yourself vulnerable. You opened yourself up and said, hey, this is what's going on in the background of my heart. And not only had I had already the forgiveness of God, but I needed I needed to hear from friends who could look at me and go, oh, been there, maybe I've done that, but irregardless, you're forgiven. So my question to you and to me, what if we had the golden rule running in the backgrounds of our minds all the time? He said, Jesus, help me to live out love. That's our short form for us. Let's pray. Father, you are the God of love, justice, and mercy. Our gold standard of living and loving is you, no one else. And yet, Father, we, we find ourselves in the midst of conversations, in the midst of being found in community, in the midst of being on social media and desiring to respond 
desiring to get the one up, to shove, to push, to condemn, to control. Yet Jesus, you call us in this one sentence summary of the Sermon on the Mount and the whole Bible to do to others as we would have done to us. Father, for some of my friends who see injustice done to them and respond in like kind, would you forgive them now? For my friends who, who, who are finding themselves in a place where they, they realize there's some pushing and shoving, almost like on the schoolyard, and they desire to live in the golden rule, would you speak to their hearts right now and allow them to live the standard that Jesus has taught us to live? Would you bring us all into the standard of living and of love for one another? I'm grateful for you, Father, who's willing to send your Son, our Savior, to demonstrate what it truly meant and means to love. To empty oneself out at great cost to redeem and restore those who are lost. Father, may we follow in your footsteps. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems the only way we can live out that love is if we've encountered that love ourselves, if we've glimpsed it, if we've looked into the eyes of love. So this morning, as we, as we prepare to take what we have experienced ourselves out into the world, let's enter in to the throne room of God. Would you stand as we poke our heads to join the angels and singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's do that now this morning. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold him jesus son of god messiah the lamb the roaring lion the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. He's right here. Behold him. He who chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our debt, buried death as he rose to
Well, friends, as we go into this week, let us do to others as we'd have them do to us. Live out love. We want to uh, thank you for being with us today. At the Within about 20 minutes or so, we'll start our, um, our congregational meeting. And if you have children in the kids' zone, would you please go get them? Have a great week.